Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm so glad that you're here because I'm yeah. excited. One, for people to know more about you, but also I've known you for, I feel like eon years, but mm -hmm. some of the questions I know that's going to come up will make me know you more in a okay. weird, weird sort of way. I think mm -hmm. there's questions that I've never really asked you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, this is a segment that I've created called Give Them Their Flowers. Um, and it's the whole point of it is that I just wanted to give really inspirational and influential artists in our scene um, some recommend some not recommendations, some recognition um, and give them their flowers while they're here to hear them as well. Uh, and just to hear them about uh, hear about their history, their um, current work and any kind of future developments that they've got going on whilst also giving them the floor to, you know, give any flowers to other mm. people because, you know, mm. it takes an entire village to be Absolutely. as awesome, as awesome as you. But for those watching that might not know who this awesome pattern print, bright <laughs> leopard print yeah, lady Do not is. adjust your sex. <laughs> this is really what's happening. <laughs> for those that might not know who you are, I'd love for you to say your name and what it is that you do. Sure. Um, I'm Liza Valance and I'm artistic director of Studio Three Arts in Barking. Whoop, whoop. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're going to get into what that means and the whole demographic of Barking and how what Studio 3 does in that amazing kind of art rich, enriched area. Mm. But before we do that, I'd love to play a game. Is that right? Oh, God, you scare me, Jade. Go on, let's do it. OK. Da -da -ba! <laughs> That's my uh, entrance show music. Good. Yeah, yeah, I like so, it. So... Um, what we want to do is some really quick fire round questions. Okay. Don't think about it too much. Just whatever comes yeah. to the top of your head and okay. just shoot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as, as concise as you can get it. Oh, Lovely. okay. Okay. So what is your earliest artistic memory? Um, when I was about five or six, my dad was in the minor strike and there was this, uh, the union put on um, a Turkish night for all this, the minor strike families. Yeah. And I remember watching belly dancers um, and it's really stayed in my mind because I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And there were sequins and lush foods. And I was like, what's going on? Like, what, what is this world? I want this world. So is, yeah, that, is that, that where, really is that where the disco ball and the whole sequin energy came from? I mean, I think it was an early start for that. Yeah, yeah. But that definitely <laughs> sticks in my mind as, as being a really sort of prominent thing for me. That minor strike stuff, I want to yeah. pin that because I really want to come back to that yeah, when, yeah. We, when we talk later. But mm -hmm. wow. Okay, great. So what's your favourite song, most recent song to get down to? Good as hell, Lizzo. Ah! I'm messing around. Favorite. No, yeah, she she don't she don't play. She don't I just, play. I love her. I love everything about her. She's not ramping on any level, and any she's level. owning her body. She's owning her image, and I just yeah, I just want a piece of that. Yeah, she's she's fire. All mm. right, I give you that. I give you that a little bit. Yes. Good job. Okay, next one. Other than you, obviously, <laughs> mm. who is another really artistic person in your family? Um, my mum was um, uh, quite artistic. She was in like Amdram companies and stuff when I was growing up. So um, okay. she, yeah, so she did loads of sort of uh, musical theatre and, and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Wicked. Okay. Um, four, what is your best advice you've received and from whom? Oh, my word. That's not a quick fire question, Jade Hackett. Um... <laughs> um it's okay let's know. say one one of them one really good piece of advice that you've received and from whom um so when I was at when I was at uni um one of my lecturers was called Ali Campbell and he always said good feedback is good planning and I didn't really know what it meant until I started running projects right and um, for me that's that's really important if you don't spend the time to reflect on the thing you've just done Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll likely make the same mistakes again yeah. and that one always sticks on my head because it's quite a good little good little saying good feedback is good planning good feedback is good planning okay people out there please mm -hmm. make sure you write that down all right keep going 
what all what was the last dance spectacle that you saw that really kept like may put you in awe oh um well we just did our emerging choreographers platform last yes. week at, at redbridge yes Johnson, we did. Uh, we're gonna which... touch on that it was fire, you know, it's just a room full of young people at that stage in their careers where anything could happen sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I suppose in terms of like a whole spectacle and in terms of what it means, mm. it's got to be Black Dog, Bota Seva. Got to be. It's insane, isn't it? It's ridiculous. And every time what I've seen What is going on in their quads with that funny little bum That shuffle? little walk thing, trust Ooh. me. I've watched it. And every time, I think I've seen it about three times now. And every time I'm still like, yeah. How are you doing this? Yeah. I agree. I think that's a really, really good one. <laughs> okay, keep going. What oh, what was something really difficult for you to learn? Um, so I'm disabled. I've got a degenerative uh, condition in my in my spine. And, and a really difficult thing for me to learn was that it's okay to articulate that as being part of my identity. Yeah. For ages and ages and ages, I was a bit embarrassed about it. I mm -hmm. never asked for my access needs to be met. I never talked about it as part of my like creative aesthetic. Yeah. And because I think I didn't want to own up to the fact that I've got a degenerative condition. Mm -hmm. But the minute I kind of welcomed it in, it, it gave me a whole new outlook on stuff. So yeah. it was really hard to go through, but actually it's been super valuable as well. 100%. You go girl. Mm. All right. Last two. We're doing good. Um, what would you tell your younger self? with it stay with it mm. it's gonna be all right and imposter syndrome is affecting everybody in the room everyone okay. in the room is feeling as insecure as you right now so pipe down it ain't all about you stick with it okay <laughs> i feel like that's a pin yeah we want to revisit but 100 okay. mm -hmm. keep that advice um last one what was the moment you fell in love with what you do That's a bit of a hard one. But there was a there was a moment um, when I was at uni and I, I studied um, forum theatre, particularly the work of Augusto Boal. And um, same lecture I mentioned earlier, Ali Campbell had, had put he got me this work placement in a, a Bangladeshi boys youth club in Stepney. Mm -hmm. And it was me and this group of Bangladeshi boys who were like bouncing off the walls. They'd all just played football and then just come into this room with me to do drama. I was like this is brilliant. Like, there's all this like, crazy energy of a bunch of kids that didn't know they were going to come and do drama. Not really that fussed about doing drama, but we just got into it. And yeah. I remember it just being like, I could like see over the top of them in the middle of the session, a bit of the ceiling fell down and someone nicked a hoover and various other things. But it just felt like, I love this energy that anything yeah. might happen. I, yeah. I, that's what I really thrive on. Yeah. That, I feel like that's the best part of working with young people it so keeps you on your toes that like yeah. there's no generic blanket way and mm. every day is a new day every yes. every day's new things coming out of them Definitely. so uh yes yes Liza Woo! Ah! everyone in the room is clapping for you right thank now you. thank, thank you, you all right <laughs> so some of those pinned mm. things that we were just talking about I'd really love to like see if you can touch upon yeah. um this is the part as well, I think, for me that I'm really interested in, which is I know you up from a certain point yeah. all up until now. But all of this stuff here, this other stuff, mm -hmm. your history is something mm -hmm. that I'm actually really, really curious about. Okay. Um, and how you came, how you came to be Welsh, <laughs> which, 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 which is your little uh, village? I'm from Aberdeen. There we go. So what is that journey from there over to Barking, yeah. leading like one of the awesomest arts charities ever? How do you, what's that journey? And if you could break it down in like five, yeah. five yeah. key points, that would be awesome. Go for it. Um, so I think it goes, uh, grew up in working class village. Um, my dad worked for the coal board. So um yeah, there was loads of kind of those sorts of Welsh working class cultural forms around me, but probably just that. Mm. Um, my dad, as I said earlier, was in the minor strike. So, you know, money was tight, that, you know, and and actually not just money, but sort of new and innovative cultural experiences. But were quite tight where I grew up. For, so, sorry, just for the young, we might have some younger viewers. So they yeah. might not understand the 
cultural and political time of what mm-hmm. that would be yeah so so um I mean I will do it uh, I as will do best it as you can if, if I if I try <laughs> to do this so um 1984 um huge um one of the biggest kind of uh strikes money uh, pay disputes ever in British history um the miners against basically Margaret Thatcher as um mm. uh, prime minister at the time and it meant that lots and lots and lots thousands of um men predominantly were out of work for um more than a year whilst still on the picket line mm-hmm. um w- whilst kind of negotiating with the government better paying conditions and it was horrendous and very violent there was lots of violence um, particularly up the, in the north of the country in places like Orgreave there was a very uh, particular clash mm. between the police and the, the striking miners um, and I think for lots of places particularly um, South Wales and the north actually most uh, notably it was a really difficult time because it was the primary um, industry in those areas and it was completely eradicated and pretty much after that then mm. all the mines pretty much started to shut down so it you know I grew up in a place that kind of defined itself around mining and the coal industry kind of thing mm. that was the, the the dominant kind of culture so like loads of like where I live all of the little houses were all built for miners to live in that's, that's kind of what they were sort of back a day so you know we, we sort of inherited mm. that culture mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. um so yeah so th- so that's kind of what it was so my dad my dad wasn't a miner but he worked for the coal industry so you know he was he was an allied profession type thing he was um yeah he worked with coal so that was my sort of earliest kind of uh cultural context if you like yeah where I grew up there was um a theatre in my in my village because I'm I'm from like so Aberdeer is the town and then there's this little village it's so detailed now no one do you think I'm I'm loving it so there's this little village called Aberamon and there was a theatre in Aberamon and um my godfather um was the director of it so it was amdram theater but he'd worked in the west end and stuff like that and um so we just did loads of amdram shows and my mum was in the shows for years and years and my dad was um a stage and for years and years so from being little you know if my parents didn't have childcare, which they you know mostly didn't in those days we just yeah. got taken to rehearsals or taken yeah. to the shows and stuff so i was always around it but it was it was very specifically musical theater Right. which is not my bag now, yeah. but it was my first um, contact with, yeah. with, yeah. with performing oh. arts. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so there was that, and I'm a show-off in my jeans. Um, <laughs> and then I'm also, probably because of the minor strike as well, really political. Yeah. So you've got these two kind of parallel things going on. So, so that's the early thing, is minor strike, Amdram theatre, and then I get to secondary school and stuff like that, and... I'm hella political by this point. So I'm organizing, um, you know, petitions so that we can have a summer uniform, like on home and away, things like that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the important stuff, Jade. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, yeah, I I find, I say find, find a megaphone in the head teacher's office and I, you know, use oh, it appropriately. Man. Things like that. So, so, lo- so loads of my stuff was kind of quite politicized. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I moved to London and then I discovered that... that I was 18, I came to uni, I went to Queen Mary and Westfield College, as it was called okay. then, or Queen Mary University of London now. Yeah. And I and I discovered this thing called Forum Theatre, right, um, which is led by um, a, a man called Augusto Boal mm-hmm. and from Brazil. And it's all about kind of using theatre to make sense of the world. And it, it was it was kind of traditionally to be used with kind of oppressed communities mm-hmm. um, to try and make them aware of the situation they were in. So it's kind of like a rehearsal for real life. So you'd just watch a scene and then your facilitator will go, so what could they have done differently there? What could they have done differently there? It's all about, it's all about kind of, it's very, very political. Mm -hmm. And it's all about kind of using um, those tools to kind of negotiate for a better deal in life. And it's particularly for oppressed people. So I, I mean, you know, music to my ears. Like I was like, oh my God, this is me. Like, this is me. (laughs) So I just got amongst it. I got amongst it and um, my parents had to remortgage their house for me to go to uni. So yeah. I had to rinse every last little scrap out yeah. of that course. Yeah. So I did I did loads of different bits and bobs all over the place. So then I did that. And then I went off like touring, um, working as an actor facilitator, um, doing this kind of work, worked in um, prisons and mental health settings and care homes and stuff like that. And then I, I found Studio Three Arts and hung around long enough that they had to give me the top job in the end. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so then I, you know, and since, since being artistic director, I've been really able to sort of 
refine my practice, particularly around kind of dramaturgy and direction within um, hip hop theatre, which is a thing that I, you know, love, 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 love doing. And it's my latest, I suppose it's the thing I've come to the most recent, but it feels yeah. like I'm home. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It feels like yeah. I'm home. Yeah. Because the, the work that comes out of Studio 3 has always been really, really top notch. I feel like it's an um, incredible segue for a lot of young people as well to go yeah. on to do the thing that they want to do. Yeah. But they maybe the the actual schooling spaces haven't really facilitated those spaces for them. Mm. But it feels like more like professional development spaces more than just like a youth club. Do you get yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, the central premise of of my work as, as an individual artist, but also a studio through arts is, is about creating access and removing barriers to arts participation in its widest form. Yeah. So that doesn't mean just like, oh, you know, we'll put on a show with cheap tickets and you can be an audience member. It means you can be a producer, a curator, a writer, mm, you know, anything, yeah. anything. And so, and sometimes those barriers are just psychological. It could just be as simple as that's not for the likes of me. Yeah. Um, or it might be, you can't afford it, or it might, you know it's rubbish and you don't want to go and watch it but it's my job to really interrogate those barriers and reduce them yeah. and get rid of them for everyone yeah the one of the best things for me oh there's been so many awesome moments there but one of the best ones I think was having the young people perform with Matthew Bourne and the oh. whole team um oh, talk, yeah. talk, talk about it because yeah yeah well it was it was one of those kind of chance things really to begin with so mm. I was speaking at um uh, an event at the King's Fund in London and I'd written this speech um, funnily enough about uh, the minor strike and it was a because that, that Turkish night that I mentioned earlier that was the mm. first time I ate a kebab right and so <laughs> I'd written this whole speech about my first kebab and was using it as this like metaphor for you know new cultural experiences and blah 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 and when I turned up there it was the poshest room full of people right mm. it was so posh imposter syndrome goes ur, 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 like yeah, this yeah yeah but I still think, well, I ain't got nothing else written. I've got to do this speech to this room full of these posh people about a kebab. I've just got to do it now. I'm here, like. So, um, oh, it makes me cringe when I think about it. So I just did this speech and, you know, it was a mixed response because I don't know if many people in the room that, like even had a kebab or knew what it was. But then one geezer comes to talk to me at the end and he's like, oh my God, that was, that was really brilliant, blah, blah. I'm Paul and I work for, I work with Matthew Bourne. I was like, oh my God, I've just talked about a kebab in front of someone that was. <laughs> and then we kept in touch and we kept like trying to find little ways to work together and it never really came to anything. And then about three years later, Paul Smethurst um, called me and was like, I've got it, Liza. I know, I know how we're going to do it. We're doing Romeo and Juliet at Sadler's and I want to do two big community um, productions around that. One up north in Bradford, and I want the other one to be with Studio Three Arts in Barking. Um, and we just hashed a plan to make it happen. So, yeah. you know, working with 20 young people um, from, you know, largely disadvantaged communities in, in Barking and Dagenham and, and the surrounding areas, um, working with, with Paul and Sam Archer, another choreographer from New Adventures, and then some other woman called Jade something. Don't know. Do you know? No, don't know. Don't know. Anyway. And um, so, yeah, so we had four weeks of, of working and then Show Dower presented it on the main stage at Sadler's. And with, with the know, whole set and everything, isn't the whole, it? Yeah, the whole the whole Matthew Bourne New Adventures Romeo and Juliet set um with our young people just killing it on that stage. And it was one of those ones where I sort of thought, if I never work again, the, right. I'm all right, you know. I'm right. all right, because this happened. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and it's, it's all kind of naff, but like I kept the program because like my my signature was next to Matthew Bourne's in the program. Thick. And it sounds like such a silly little thing. But when I reflect back on, you know, that Turkish night of the miners' strike, and yeah. then standing on that stage doing a, you know, saying words in front of Matthew Bourne and this whole and like bag yeah. of people from Barking and Dagger, like 500 people or and something. And we're all like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. But it, it, that's the funny thing, because we kept it real. We, you know, yeah. we, we, we yeah. brought Barking and Dagger and to Sadler's World. We didn't try and... Fit yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, we just did our thing. And that's yeah. why it was important, I think. It, yeah, was, it was amazing. It was incredible. So uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant segue into what things are happening currently now with Studio 3 mm -hmm. and uh, the, the great things that are going to be coming up. 
Um, so let us know what are Studio Three cooking up. So I suppose the, the really big thing at the minute is that we are refurbishing and rebuilding our art centre in Barking, um, which um, for me is in equal parts really, really exciting and also really terrifying and, and horrible. Um, because it's a lot of money, you know, it's a lot of money, it's public money. Mm -hmm. And Jade, you know what I'm like about public money. I can't even let staff members eat a biscuit that's been bought for a participant. Yeah. I'm so like tight about public money because, and again, it's coming from working class background, like, you know, you don't you don't waste money like that. Yes. So to have, you know, just shy of 1.8 million pounds that I've spent, I I know ugh, it makes me feel sick even saying it, but it's like it's taken me mm. five years or something to, to raise that money. And so I've got to spend every single penny wisely. As, as wisely as I as I possibly can. So that's going on at the minute. So we are building an extension, which will be um, a second rehearsal studio. Mm -hmm. So that'll be there. Um, we are bringing in what's called a change in place, which is a industry standard um, adult and young people with disabilities changing room. So it'll have a hoist and a shower, accessible toilet, all that kind of mm. stuff. Um, and I think we might be the only one of those in a public building in Barking. So, you know, it's really important, you know, if we yeah. mean what we say about accessibility, it's got to be there. It's really wow. important. Yeah. Um, a new recording studio and a green room and a live room and you know all of that stuff um cafe bar mm. so please join me for an aperol spritz at the bar <laughs> um should be quite nice um yeah and just yeah nice new dressing rooms um a, a cupboard is becoming my office which is no more than I deserve <laughs> and um yeah it's, it's really exciting but it's it's really scary because I've got to go on site to put an RDAT on and like Mince about like I know what I'm doing and I'm it's the biggest <laughs> performance of my life, man. I, I yeah. rode past there the other day and it's all boarded up and I was like, yeah. wow, it's it's the space is really, really, you know, it was it was humble beginnings, mm. I suppose, but yeah. the work that came out of there was in, insane. So oh, now yeah. that space is, you know, you've you've done really well with raising Thank that you. money and that space is gonna yeah. open up so much more. What kind of work then can be commissioned and be, you know, if there is any kind of new kind mm. of work that you can engage with now because of the space has shifted? Well, I, th I think we definitely can. One of the things I'm trying to explore at the moment is I'm coming up with a sort of social value model, right? So say if, um, I don't know, a theatre company wants to come and hire our rehearsal studio for rehearsals. Right. I'm saying to them, you can, and you can have it for slightly cheaper if you commit to giving something back to the people in Barking and Dagenham. Right. So I'm coming up with this sort of model where it's quite dynamic in that sense. Yeah, so anyone yeah, that yeah. comes in has got to commit to giving something, to offering something back to the creative community in Barking and Dagenham. That's so lovely. I'm trying to work out what that might look like at the minute. Um, and we've got, you know, some models of doing that. So I think that will open up interesting possibilities. Yeah. Um, we want to receive more work um, and we will have a budget exclusively for that, for bringing in companies and artists that want to show work in a place like Barking and Dagenham. But also I'm going to be creating more work because I think. The yes. Thing, yes, I know. Right. It's so exciting. But that feels like the bit that's been missing. Yeah. Is, is me having the creative space to um, get in the studio and to make stuff happen on my own terms. 100, so are you writing, are you? Um, yeah, What's yeah, I've got a couple of things sort of in the pipeline at the minute. So I am in R&D for a show at the moment, exploring the, the feminist history of Barking. Like people won't know this, but Barking's got a really rich history of like, feminist icons. So right back to like the fourth century, the, the Abbey in Barking was run by a female abbess. Um, Elizabeth Fry is connected to Barking. Um, yeah, there's, there's also um, Mary Wollstonecraft is one of the earliest feminists on record. She's mm -hmm. got a connection to Barking. So in my head, I've got this idea of a show where all of these women meet. And, right. Uh, yeah, what, what happens kind of thing. Happened, so um, yeah. I'm working with a, another theatre practitioner called Jules Tipton to just kind of interrogate that a little bit and yes. see, what, see what might come of it. Yeah, lovely. I'm really excited to hear that you are going to be creating work in there because I think the work that comes out of there, as I said many a time, is awesome. But if your head spearing what that yeah. looks like, it feels like a lovely, complete image. So, yeah. I think like I'm I'm so excited. Sorry. I'm just the revelation of all this stuff is like because mm. I know what that space could be and what it is and what you're, you know, what you're you're bringing it to 
to grow to. So because yeah. of all of that, and I know that it takes a massive village to make Studio 3 happen, mm. um, we're giving artists like yourself a platform to kind of give th- one to maybe three flowers um, to people and, uh, you know, governors, board members, family mm. members, whoever it might be. And a first teacher we've had at some point. Um, but yeah, just to give a spotlight to people that have been part of your village to help you mm. be the awesomeness that you are. Who who would you like to do that? Oh, to? it's going to be one of those ones where whoever I include means I'm leaving somebody else out. No, that's just the pressure. Everyone, I'll say, there's a I'll whole village. Me. Um, I, I think particularly now where we are on Studio Three Arts' journey, I, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation if it wasn't for Karen West Wiley, who's the chair yes. of our board. Yes. Um, and she's coming to the end of her tenure as, as chair. She'll be, uh. she'll be you know, finishing Christmas time. So if anyone out there wants to be the new chair of Studio Three Arts, we are taking... <laughs> 10 <laughs> years as a chair, though, that yeah. says something yeah. about it's the relationship. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and she's, you know, she has uh, shown me how it's okay to be um, a bold leader and to really you know, challenge your thinking around women are bossy, men are assertive, right. and that whole thing, and, and, and she's really um, helped me to find my voice, I suppose, as, yeah. as a leader, yeah. Um, so yeah, I could, I couldn't not acknowledge um, Karen in this moment. Um, big up Karen. Big up Karen, yeah, um, probably as well, in, in a similar sort of way, um, I'd, I'd have to acknowledge Charlene Carter yes. at, this, at this point. And there won't be a person watching this that doesn't know who Charlene right. Carter is, frankly. I hope not. Um, but, you know, Charlene is a creative producer, but more than that, she lives and breathes Barking and Dagenham. Lives and breathes. And she place. would fight for that place with her last breath. Yep. And everything that she is, is about connecting people up and you know she's generous to a fault like yeah, and yeah she's and her energy is really infectious and I yeah. was like, honored to to direct her autobiographical yeah. um hip-hop theater piece a few years yeah. ago called 1360, 1360. we're hoping to get back in the studio to um rework that and, and take it on tour um so yeah th- this this couldn't go without um acknowledging 100%. her 100 and then if I may have a third um you're probably gonna know what I'm gonna say. I'm, I'm gonna mention a young man called Kevin McKendie at this yeah. point. Um, so Kevin was a participant on our projects for many, many years from the age of 13 up to about sort of 1920. Um, and he passed away a few years back. And um, I, I still miss his energy kind of thing yeah. around the place. Yeah. And, and he, yeah. he came to Studio Three Arts with his full chest. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd come in at like nine in the morning and Kev would be sitting on the steps outside ready to come and use the music studio. Yeah. And, and even though he was a young person, I could still like have a really detailed conversation, conversation with him about decisions him. I was making and stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, and you know, his energy is still is still in that place. And there's lots of people who around when Kev was around who were still connected to Studio Three Arts. And I, I do feel like he shaped me, you know, he he yeah. has had an impact on my life. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right to not acknowledge him like this. All of, and, and at the end of the day, there is so many people oh, that have helped yeah. Studio Three, but those three people, I definitely concur that they have been a, a, a triumph to that space and mm. um, a test, also a testament to the kind of space that kind of that space wants to engage with the yeah. energy that that space wants to engage with. So, yes, one hundred, a hundred percent, Liza. Thank you. So oh, much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for Come having me. End. Oh, God. But um, yeah, I'm I'm just so happy to see your face, to see mm. the the smile that you are. And um, yeah, thank you so so much. Continue the formidable work. And I hope that this has really taught a lot of new viewers about what Studio Three does. And- also, like before we finish, can we just take a moment for you though, Jade? Because ah! like- you know, when, when you when you first started to come and, and work with Studio Three Arts, it, it was as co choreographer of a of a street dance company. Yeah. And like you know, me watching your journey, that's been completely inspirational. And for you to now be in the seat where you're interviewing me, I'm like, this is this is it. This is everything. So I'm yeah. here to celebrate you as well, my friend. Thank you. Thank for everything you. You've done. And, and Studio Three was really pivotal. You know, I was there for about ten years, so it. Yeah. I I was there because I saw the work that it was doing. I loved the work that it was. The 
input that it was putting into young people's lives and working with young people I'm so passionate about that space is so passionate about and it just felt right it aligned everything that I wanted from mm. that period of my time you know of, of that period yeah. of my life um and also set me up going forward into whatever new ventures I am one of them being here so it's yeah. a bit full circle this it moment is. it's so brilliant it's lovely it's so lovely thank you so much I, uh, I can't Thank tell you, you how much it means. So, yeah, Liza Valance, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Thank you. Bye.